Good morning. My name is Renelle Miles, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention's Medicine Mind the Gap seminar series. This seminar series explores issues at the intersection of research, evidence, and clinical practice, areas in which conventional wisdom may be contradicted by recent evidence. From the role of advocacy organizations in medical research and, the pre and policy to the importance of behavioral interventions, the Office of Disease Prevention hopes to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to challenge what we think we know and to think critically about our role in today's research environment. Before I begin, I have some housekeeping items. To participate by Twitter, follow us at, at NIHPrevents and submit questions using the hashtag NIHMTG. You may also email questions to prevention at mail.nih.gov. There is also a link to a feedback form at the bottom of the video cast page where you can submit questions during the talk. At the conclusion of today's talk, we will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via email and Twitter. Lastly, please visit the seminar page on the ODP website at prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap following today's talk and click the link to the seminar evaluation under the resources section to submit your feedback about the seminar. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Karina Davidson is a director of the Center for Behavioral Cardiovascular Health and Cardiology and the Vice Dean of Organizational Effectiveness at Columbia University Medical Center. She received her PhD in clinical health psychology and her master's in industrial organizational psychology from University of Waterloo, Canada. She has conducted randomized control trials of anger management, stress reduction, and depression treatments for healthy hypertensive and postmyocardial infarction patients. She has won numerous national and international awards for her research accomplishments, as well as teaching and mentoring awards for her efforts to train the next generation of physician leaders. She has served as elected president of most of her professional organizations. She has recently appointed to the state's preventive services task force, where she is honored to help evaluate a broad range of clinical preventive health care services. She has authored over 200 peer-reviewed articles, numerous editorials, and book chapters, served as editor for various handbooks, and served on multiple scientific journal editorial bo boards. Her current research interests include N of one trial designs for health behavior and health services research to improve the education of future physicians and the care of our hospital patients. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Davidson and turn the session over to her at Columbia University. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here and to talk about um, an interesting methodology that may have many applications to areas that you're interested in. I'd first like to start by acknowledging uh, the great um, support that I have received from numerous institutes. I do have a K-24. I think that's a vital um, uh, grant for me to have from NHLBI to help me teach um, and mentor the next generation of physician scientists in this as well as a number of other uh, methodologies and interventional um, designs that they are using for their health services research. I also received um, an R01 to examine some innovative N of 1 correlational method development um, uh, that I think was quite critical in informing the intervention designs I'm going to talk to you about today. And finally, currently, I have a National Cancer Institute contract to develop this kind of N of 1 health service or intervention for um, patients who survive cancer who have depressive symptoms. And PCORI has uh, provided funding to us to interview and work as partners with patients and with primary care clinicians in order to understand how this kind of trial design could be used in clinical practice. So with that, um, I'll tell you about some of the questions, assumptions of running most of our uh, traditional intervention designs and why that led me to my interest in um, N of 1 trial design. So some of the assumptions uh, that we started to think about both statistically and methodologically um, is that treating complex relapsing recurring diseases or symptoms um, are often presumed at some core level that the, prim the problem is binary, that is present or absent. So of course diabetes can be present or absent. 
uh, but you can have varying levels of glucose control across the day, across the week, across the season, um, across different treatment paradigms. And that means you have to be thinking about it continuously rather than binarily. Um, so we have many examples of that. As mentioned in my introduction, I often work on depressive symptoms or stress symptoms or anger symptoms. Um, sometimes I somewhat unwillingly get um, pulled into weight or smoking or exercise um, as areas that we need intervention. And those, of course, are um, enduring, time-varying phenomenon rather than being binary, present or absent. Um, my center has been um, dedicated to the study of blood pressure for years, and that has meant that some of the statistical models and interventions we have tried to do, again, have that problem that they're not binary. And I have uh, many colleagues who work on epilepsy, migraine, as I mentioned earlier, glucose control, drug use, cancerous cell proliferation, all of which across time often vary continuously. A second assumption we have is that the Treatment target identification is best conducted by averaging across persons. Um, that is, if we're trying to figure out if something is a reasonable treatment target, we take in phase one trials five or six people, we average across that, and we assume that that's a universal identification process, that we can discover a treatment that will work for most people through that process. We also assume the same about dose. That is, that it is best identified by averaging across persons. Um, that, um, and the problem, as everyone knows clinically, is that there may be person-specific dose levels. So the dose of treatment required by one person differs from the dose required by another. And yet most of our um, methodological work in identifying best dose is done by averaging across persons. Next, the dose response is best identified by averaging persons. That's what we tend to do methodologically. And it may be that there are person-specific dose response curves. So the time lag between dose exposure and the response found in one person differs from the time lag found in another. So this can lead to a quandary, as my statistician said when I first started talking to him about these things. He said, is the, you know, is the treatment one for everyone, three or four for everyone, one for different subgroups? three or four for different subgroups, one for one person, or three to four for one person. He thought this was turtles all the way down um, and was going to be problematic for us in thinking about all of the places in which you could be thinking at the individual level for um, fixing a parameter or understanding the range of responses, uh, and there would be no generalizability. I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, actually towards the end of the talk, how I think we can build back up to generalizability from this design. So just to make this more concrete for you, I know I've gone over those assumptions fairly quickly. I'm going to show you um, four things that are time varying, that is they move across time. And in this case, I'm going to show you a couple of examples for depressive symptoms. So if we take depressive symptoms at time one, at time two, at time three, and time four, represented by the big Zs across the top, we could be looking at an iron supplement or at a stress reduction or at exercise levels and start to understand um, across, averaging across people what is the average response to any of those kinds of interventions. And we could wonder about the dose response, that is the response to iron for reducing symptoms might be fairly short, um, but we might have so say here, but we might have for a different type of tr treatment a longer um, time response like a year. And we would again average across people to go the average response say is one month, when it might in fact be that for some people there is a response but it's a year long and for another person there's a response but it's a day long. And the question I posed to the statisticians that I work with is would we get the same answer from an N of one model? So here you have person one just indicating maybe they have a response to a vitamin D supplement um, in one day, and here's another person who maybe it takes four days. And we all think of that as variability or confidence interval or standard error around the average point response, but maybe the way we need to start thinking about it is differently. So this is actually from um, uh, one of my 
program projects with NHLBI, I actually looked at the prevalence of possible causes for depression in patients who'd had a myocardial infarction, and I'm representing for you the percent of people who were depressed, I had 119 in this sample, and uh, what various causes of, or possible causes of depression they had. So you can see um, we had very few with a B12 deficiency. We had some who had hypothyroidism. We had some who had hypothyroidism. We had some with a probable sleep disorder. Uh, we had a very um, large overlap of anemia um, uh, with a couple of other symptoms. We had straight anemia, and then we had what we considered essential, that is, people who had no known medical cause that we had measured for their depression, which could have been stress or a number of things that we didn't have a measure on. And the most typical way that we run an intervention, and this is certainly as, as a person who has run many interventions, this is implicitly the model that we use when we're first starting to try and intervene on a phenomenon. Regardless of what the actual proportion of putative causes might be for someone ending up with high depressive symptoms, we go ahead and we try some kind of um, treatment for reducing that depressive symptom level. So we try an SSRI or we try increased sleep or we try sleep hygiene. We try something and we don't match that treatment to necessarily that particular person having that particular deficit. Now, in some areas, that works well. So for people who have um, hyperlipidemia, we simply put everyone on a statin, and we don't really spend a lot of time investigating at the individual level whether that person ended up with a high cholesterol because of a predisposition of genetics or because they're um, having a high-fat diet or because they're not exercising, or because they're overweight. We simply prescribe one intervention that works universally relatively well for all to try and get the cholesterol level down, or the depressive symptom level down, or the blood pressure down. So that's a normative design that we use, and it answers the question, does a generic depression intervention work for the hypothetical average person? We have a second common design that we use that's still normative. We um, actually measure one putative cause for the symptom or the disease that we're interested in, and we only select into our trials people who have that. So in this case, I'm showing you looking for people who have low vitamin D, and then we randomize those people in this case to perhaps a control condition and a vitamin D supplementation, and then we measure depression. And the second design subgroups those first at risk by the putative cause, D deficiency in this case. We randomize only those people, and what is personalized comes by grouping the patients into smaller and smaller groups. So it's still a normative design, but it answers the question in the group with the known cause or mechanism. Does this intervention improve depression for the hypothetical average person? Now I'm going to move to N of 1 uh, intervention design. So if, for example, we are interested, and I've changed things around from the previous example, in somebody who, and I'm sorry, this should say N of 1, somebody who has depression, and perhaps the majority of their uh, depression is vitamin D deficiency um, because we've measured it across time, and as their vitamin D deficiency remediates or accelerates, they're, they're, they're having a lagged response in which their depressive symptoms are getting better or worse, and maybe a bit of it we don't know what it is. And we could try an open label with that person that just looks like a dose escalation. That is, we give them a low-level uh, supplement, and then we give them a highest, maybe we've randomized, and then maybe a, a higher one still, until we see the dose at which we start to see that they're actually having a depressive symptom response. 
if we were to control, we might not know as we're doing this when they're receiving placebo or when they're receiving an active treatment so that we were blinded, both ourselves and the patient, to whether or not um, they were receiving what we thought was the cause, the, the modifiable cause of their depression, in order to see whether, as we do repeated measures of their depression, if in fact we're going to help them by continuing them on this supplement. So in the open label, you're randomizing within the patient to an individualized dose of treatment. In the control, you've added in placebo or sham, and you've um, blinded either the patient, the experimenter, or both. Um, it's an individual design, but it's tailored to a patient's specific cause for depression. And it answers the question, if you treated the predominant underlying cause in a depressed patient in the intervention, did you improve depression in that person? Now, a fourth variant of the, a design and a second one in the N of 1 would be actually to measure across time all the possible putative causes for the particular disease or symptom that you're interested in. So you might measure exercise and stress and anemia and essential, and maybe you, you looked at iron and vitamin D and some of the other ones that I had, hypothyroidism. And you might find in one patient that this seems to be the pattern of um, time-lagged correlations between you know, not exercising and depression going up or stress being present, I'm sorry, um, just a sec here. Uh, stress going up and depression getting worse. And in this one, you might end up trying in an open label, first supplementing for um, their deficiency, then the stress management, then the exercise to see which of these actually remediates the depression in that one person. So you're only exposing one person to these. And you could also do these as a controlled uh, variant in which they're getting iron or a placebo or a supplement or um, you know, attention control as a, a, a sham for the stress management. And you're again randomizing within the patient across time rather than different patients. And in the controlled version, you're randomizing within the patient to shams or alternative treatments that are not part of your um, hypothesis about what actually is causing the disease. And you could again then blind both the patient and the experimenter in some cases. It's an individualized design and is tailored to patient-specific causes or mechanisms for their particular disease, in this case, depression. And it answers the question, if you intervene on ideographic underlying causes or mechanisms present in each patient, can you improve depression in that person? So I'm going to give you a concrete example of the fourth variant of RCT, and then I'm going to end up talking about how you can move to a generalized case out of this information uh, once you've conducted a number of these. So as is the case with most clinical decisions, predictions are necessary about a single concrete patient rather than a hypothetical normative or averaged one. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about a kid. Um, so, for example, research has shown that Ritalin affects appetite across the averaged, idealized, or hypothetical normative kid, but this result may or may not apply to a single child with many other coexisting difficulties. So this is the case of Richard, a seven-and-a-half-year-old, 34-pound, non-organic failure to thrive, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, oppositional defiant disorder child. He was already at 60 milligrams a day of Ritalin. He was hospitalized at the request of the pediatrician to increase Ritalin past the maximum dose, the maximum dose being for his age, not his weight. And so if you were to be conducting a design number four, as I showed you sort of in theory what it looks like, what you might do is first come up with your putative um, reasons or hypotheses for this one child about why he might be having this extreme attention difficulties he was experiencing, as well as many of his other difficult behaviors, which was he was not eating, he was threatening to kill others, and he was threatening to kill himself. And he was attempting both of those latter behaviors. 
So the pediatrician's implicit hypothesis was lack of sufficient medication, that we hadn't yet gotten to the right dose for this particular child. So that's an N of 1 dose escalation design he was proposing. Um, as I was the psychologist on the case, we thought about lack of structure, which is a behavioral hypothesis um, about what might be going on. Lack of sleep was raised uh, by a number of the clinical staff who had been observing this child. Lack of food, that is, he's starving as he's only 34 pounds, and that might be um, obviously profoundly affecting his behavior. Um, from a more psychodynamic perspective, it could be exposure to mother. Um, or it could be, again, from more behavioral framework and exposure to failure. So for every two-hour period during the day for four weeks uh, that he was in the hospital and at the school, um, school and hospital staff completed a behavioral analysis sheet upon which the presence or absence of problematic behaviors were recorded, along with the, pre um, the presence or absence of possible causal variables. Now, during this time, he was either receiving Ritalin at 60 milligrams, Ritalin at 30 milligrams, Ritalin at 120 milligrams, or placebo. And that was only known to the hospital pharmacist. So um, I, the psychologist, as well as others, were blinded to this. Okay. Um, so both the teacher's Connor scale was completed by the teachers as well as the actor scale was completed by the hospital staff, and they showed no significant Ritalin-related changes in Richard's behavior. We did note, uh, because we were recording all of his calories, that he was um, eating approximately 1,000 calories when he was exposed to any dose of Ritalin and about 1,250 when not on Ritalin. And on Ritalin, um, from 60 to the 120, both of those doses, there was an increase in tics and nervous movement noted, even though we hadn't asked anyone to record those. And here's just because we were interested in other outcome variables for this particular child, um, a brief set of the percent of variance explained by various different um, categories. And I'll just walk you through this briefly. When he was on the Ritalin, uh, he had an 8% uh, percent decrease in his distractible behavior. Um, he had an 11% increase in his suicidal intent and behavior. That is the number of times that he made uh, statements that he wanted to kill himself or made attempts. His calorie intake um, was, I should actually say, negative as well. Also, as noted before, went down significantly. Lack of structure was only related in 18% uh, to threatening to hurt others. The presence of his mother was um, significantly related to an increase in his distractible behavior, an increase in his suicidal behavior, and um, an increase in his caloric intake. Failure experience, I'm sorry, a negative um, association between presence of mother and caloric intake. Failure experience was related to threatening others, and caloric intake was actually related to threatening to, to hurt others. So these were all the significant correlations that we saw in the data across this child. And just because people always ask me uh, when I present this case what actually happened, I can tell you that we went to the court uh, with this data rather than with physical abuse. And he was removed from his um, uh, mother's care and put an individual foster and put back on 30 milligrams of Ritalin. Six months later, when he came back to the hospital, he had gained 22 pounds, and there had been um, no suicidal or homicidal threats at school for almost three months. Now, this sounds like a fairy tale and a made-up case. It actually was a case. So, of course, there was, um, as is typical in these cases, unfortunately, not always a good outcome. His mother had born another infant, and because I had the pleasure of working with a social work intern while we were working on this case, we actually mapped out this family. And there had been 66 children placed in foster care because of behavioral and difficult problems um, in one single proband, a family of seven siblings, a very high uh, a public health cost for not managing this family differently or offering the kind of support that might have changed outcomes for both them and their children. So 
Do we need to determine the prevalence of essential and secondary difficult behavior causes or putative causes for the diseases and symptoms that we're interested in? I believe yes. I think we need more research that looks at the normative or common core of the putative causes that we are believe related to cholesterol, to blood pressure, to migraines, um, to pain, uh, to blood pressure. Uh, when I go looking for prevalence of the putative causes, just what is the actual prevalence of those, before having a treatment study, I'm actually surprised at how often we speak to each other about what those are, but a quantitative estimate of how prevalent those putative causes are in the actual population is sometimes difficult to find. Um, do we need to determine the prevalence of the essential or secondary difficult behavior or symptom causes within subjects? Yes. I think for those relapsing remitting symptoms or complex chronic diseases that have relapsing remitting courses, we need to have more within subject data in which the natural history of what proceeds, what putative causes actually proceed in one person. Um, the flare ups, you know, in rheumatoid arthritis, in migraine, in blood pressure, in depressive symptoms would give us invaluable information about what are actual treatments that we should be continuing to develop. Should we try that first normative design, design one? I think yes. We should start treating by offering a universal treatment um, to all people, keeping in mind that we can be collecting the prevalence information in those kinds of normative designs. And I think we should also continue to use the normative design number two, which is where we have some, when we do have some clear subgroups based on the cause or mechanism, which are reasonably prevalent. Um, and if we have a treatment for that, that is, it is a, a suspected modifiable cause, we should be trying to identify just those persons, treat that particular cause, and see if that actually offsets their symptoms or disease. Should we be trying these new uh, N of 1 design. Yes. If we set up a registry of reasonably preventive, uh, sorry, prevalent preventive behavior causes or mechanisms, we could ask individual clinicians to run N of 1 trials, open or close, and upload those results to a common registry. And so to close, what I'm going to do is show you the algorithm that I think you would make some kind of informed decision about when you would use which design where. So starting on the four left, if the risk factor or disease have treatments that are successful in, in say, somewhat arbitrarily, 70 or more percent of the cases, then probably you want to go ahead and treat all cases with that particular, you know, statin or SSRI because you don't want to spend a lot of work trying to figure out what's going on with everyone if you know that you can treat them. And then for that 30% or so who fail the first line treatment, then you can start subgrouping them on highly prevalent secondary causes and see if you can not develop a universal treatment for those people specifically. If you don't have um, a single already identified universal treatment for 70% of the cases, then maybe we need to go back to establish the prevalence of the putative etiologies or risk markers or putative causes. And when we have done that, if one of them has a prevalence of 70% or more, then maybe we go ahead and develop a treatment against that treatment target um, in, and we move back to design one. On the other hand, if it's a very multi-etiological disease of which many of the chronic complex diseases and symptoms are, if there is one that is around 30% or so, it seems reasonable to subgroup on that one factor and see if we can treat that. If we are all the way down that you've got a multiple uh, etiology disease in which none of them have a high between subject prevalence, it may be time to start asking if the etiologies or risks can be determined in individuals. Obviously, there are going to be some that that's not possible. They're not time varying themselves. And then you can either decide to dose escalate on the single etiology, or you can try different treatments individually. And so with that, 
I'd like to close with a quote that inspired this research back when I was in graduate school. John Nestle wrote in 1991, wrote, one should obtain repeated measures on particular individuals and have an adequate basis for generalizing from the ideographic analyses of individuals to regularities that characterize all individuals. And I believe that is a path we should go down in order to treat and prevent complex, chronic, relapsing, remitting diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. That was a really good presentation. Um, I just want to reiterate to everyone who is um, participating that you can email your questions to prevention at mail.nih.gov. And also, you can submit questions at Twitter by using um, at NIHprevents with using the hashtag NIHMTG. Dr. Davidson, we have a couple of questions that we have received um, on your uh, presentation. Uh, one of the first questions that we received is, why have an N of 1 or single subject trials been widely used? I think that's a great <laughs> question. And um, I am speaking uh, both from some market survey research that has been published by a group here at Columbia, as well as uh, just by qualitative opinion. Um, when Gordon Guy at tried to set up an N of 1 trial service in the early 1990s up at McMaster University. He was doing everything by hand. So any behavior or blood pressure recording um, or amount of pain had to be handwritten on pieces of paper and brought in. The statistician was calculating power by hand. The uh, chemist was um, compounding the placebos and the pills by hand. And he managed to keep that up for three years, but it was an incredibly labor-intensive um, job just to get one patient through one end of one trial. I think one of the reasons we're so beautifully poised to launch into this as a large-scale operation is we now have ecological momentary assessment. We have unobtrusive ways of monitoring many symptoms, behaviors, um, feelings through many of the devices that people carry. We have automated um, ways of populating the electronic health record uh, and of calculating the power and of collecting the data in ways that don't require the kind of manual labor that was needed in the early 90s. So I think now we can. We don't have a lot of people who are teaching this method. Uh, either concretely to the clinicians or um, in theory to the people who could de be further developing the statistical methods, software packages, um, plug and play ways of just offering someone a already set up N of 1 trial for patients to start um, completing. And we don't have a system for then collecting that so that we have many patients who've gone through the same N of 1 so we can start to see what kinds of phenotypes come up inductively from the repeated measured data taken from many people. Thank you so much. Um, in this age of personalized medicine, um, N of 1 trials have become uh, pretty popular. Have you found that patients want this type of trial as well? I think still have a waste so in coming up with the language um, and the ways of introducing patients to this kind of trial, um, we've done extensive focus groups thanks to the funding from um, PCORI. And uh, even the label N of 1, although it means something to all of us who have been exposed to that kind of methodology, uh, it sounds um, like an experiment and not something easily accessible a patient. So they actually spent some time in one of our focus groups deciding that they were going to rename it. And they came up with the title patient-centered trial um, or patient-centered treatment identification as a better way of explaining to patients what it is that we're trying to do. Um, patients have some concerns uh, that it should be their physician who's monitoring all of their symptoms. And physicians have concerns that 
providing them with yet more continuous data, and particularly data that's collected 24 hours, seven days a week, is not um, going to fit with their work schedule. So we're working out some of the ways that this could be done um, inside a primary care office in a way that works for a physician and that meets the needs and the concerns of the patients who are interested in this kind of design. Thank you. We've received uh, one other additional email. Um, Dr. Davidson, not surprisingly, your ideas and methods are well articulated and the need for N01 approaches is well positioned within the research design options. Do you perchance have a publication on these ideas already that you could share with colleagues and cite? Absolutely. Um, we've got a method piece uh, that I can share perhaps after this webcast the full citation for. Um, I can also tell you that AHRQ did a full uh, report on it within the last two years, I believe, to consider issues that we didn't put in our publication, which I think are additionally important, things like the ethics. That is, is this research or is this clinical practice? Um, if it's research and it has to go through an IRB, do you have to put an IRB through for each and every single patient? Because you may find one doesn't need iron supplement for, say, a depression trial and another does. Uh, so they were thinking of some of the regulatory um, and complex issues that we're going to have to have worked through in order to get this out more uh, expeditiously to patients. Thank you for your answer. Uh, one other question that we have gotten online. Um, Dr. Davison, do you think there is a potential benefit to creating an intelligent computer system to assist the physician to create and implement an N of one practice? Um, the, the, the author of this particular email is thinking of something like a Google Plus for this particular purpose. Uh, yes, I think that's the kind of exciting opportunity that we have now, given the digital age, um, the collection of M Health data continuously, um, and the increased awareness of patients of the kinds of treatments that they want or interested in uh, trying. Um, so you could see an intelligent computer system that might ask patients, what are the symptoms that are bothering you? Um, one of the things we noticed a long time ago, we were asking patients after they left their primary care office in a completely different study, what did you talk about, what got treated, and what problems do you have? And if you had overlapping Venn diagrams, what problems they had in their daily life rarely came up as uh, health issues to discuss with their primary care physician. So for example, sleep problems, um, uh, problems with depression and anxiety and stress were often mentioned as daily problems, but not things that they decided to discuss as a health issue with their physician. A kind of Google Plus could allow a patient to say, I want to know what to do about insomnia, or I want to know what to do about my you know, low-level headaches um, that happen often. And they might be able to then start figuring out how to enter data to A, figure out what their triggers or um, possible etiologies are, and then sign up for a trial where someone's delivering them the treatment, either open uh, case or um, if they were willing to, controlled with a possible sham or alternative treatment. So those are the kinds of things that I think could make this scale up in a way that was just not possible a couple of decades ago. Remind participants that if you have a question, you can email your question to prevention at mail.nih.gov, or you can also submit your question via Twitter at NIH Prevents using the hashtag NIHMTG. The next question is centered more about resources and training opportunities. Um, this uh, particular uh, researcher wants to know if you can recommend any resources for those researchers who are interested in learning more about N01 designs in terms of the number of observations needed, how to analyze and collect the data, and especially how to assess mediation in N01 designs. I think those are excellent questions, and this is a nascent area, and so there are not easily accessible resources for each of those things. 
Um, I've worked with the Department of Biostats here at Columbia University, um, uh, as well as Joe Schwartz, who's here at Center for Behavioral Cardiovascular Health and Cardiology. And they have worked out power analyses for this, that is, the number of observations given the expected correlation size between um, an etiology and a symptom. Uh, as the person asking this question is probably aware, it's fairly complicated because of the dependency in the observations. Um, we don't yet have that in a software program or in a set of slides that uh, could be taught to someone, but I'm actually discussing with some biostatisticians starting to teach a course in that at the graduate level here at Columbia. Um, I think uh, there are there is little training yet available because I think we don't yet have enough of these trials conducted in order to start having good case examples that uh, help flesh out for people some of the assumptions and methodological issues that have to be grappled with. In the AHRQ publication um, from 2014, it does have good checklists at the end of each chapter um, about ethics, uh, uh, statistical concerns, financial concerns, and so that information I think is useful for training purposes because they were trying to get people quickly to see where something would not work so that you don't go down the path to trying one of these if you're not in the space of a symptom or an area where it's going to be possible to do. Thank you. The next uh, question centers more along uh, statistical barriers and troubleshooting. Uh, this particular researcher is, is, uh, has a question addressing how would you handle statistical power in the N1 trial? Um, is there any, are there any barriers with um, statistical power in N1 trials? Uh, there certainly are. You have to have something that's a high-frequency um, symptom uh, that can be collected repeatedly and that has, um, as the person asking the question probably is aware, quite a bit of variability. Um, we tried uh, conducting a power analysis for detecting triggers of AFib, and if the average patient has 12 to 30 AFib episodes, even if you count the silent ones, um, so they're wearing a halter continuously in order to find those. I think um, the power came back that we were going to have to collect data over 18 months in order to get a stable estimate of what were the triggers, which most patients told us was too long to wear a continuous halter model and too long to wait to find out what might be the thing they should be removing from their life or supplementing or altering in order to avoid the AFib um, episode. So you, you want... Um, a variable like blood pressure that can be measured uh, um, multiple times that is highly variable in the person uh, and that the putative causes themselves are time varying. Um, there are, in fact, many things that meet those, and I think the shortest time period we've ever had adequate power for was six weeks, um, and that was for a fast-acting drug uh, for blood pressure that was being done in one week blocks. It had a, a, a fast acting and it had a short um, half life. So we could um, power to look at a placebo versus that single drug and be fully powered with a six week block. Thank you. The next question addresses another barrier, which is cost. Um, this particular researcher wanted to know are there any differences in terms of? maybe what has been uh, analyzed through a cost analysis between NM1 experiments and traditional RCTs? Uh, I have, we have seen some cost analyses um, that were hypothetical. Uh, so those are always slightly problematic because someone is guessing what the cost would be. Um, I think it's reasonable to only look within one symptom or within one treatment within one symptom uh, so that it's a head-to-head -head comparison. That is, if you were trying to figure out for hypertension, if a new drug was superior to a standard of care drug, what kind of design um, 
one would you have to uh, conduct, that is how many subjects, versus how many subjects would you have to do at the end of one in order to uh, see a benefit for the average end of one patient. I've not seen people yet consider that kind of head-to-head -head comparison, and so um, I can't answer the question directly. What I can say is that we often end up running incredibly expensive phase three trials, and we have 5 to 30% who respond positively, you know, and maybe 30% who respond not at all, and maybe 20 or 30% who have harm. If that had been run as an N of 1 trial, that is repeated um, measures across time with time randomized rather than subjects randomized, I think you might have some cases in which you would end up with better power with fewer subjects. Um, and you'd then be able to look at the phenotype of who had harm and who benefited in a way that would be more rich in the data you would have uh, from that within subject comparison trial. In your experience, uh, what would be an example of a pre preventative behavioral N of 1 trial? And have you conducted any of these types of trials before? Uh, have a stress and um, daily exercise R01 um, uh, that just uh, finished recently, and we're actually in the process of analyzing it. Uh, it was preventive. It was taking patients who intermittently exercised and were considered able to exercise, but didn't always. So we removed people who had a schedule that they kept to no matter what, and we actually had a run-in period to see that people had variance in whether how much they exercised each day that was a, you know, a, a reasonable amount, rather than somebody who runs three days, three times a week, or five times a week, or whatever. Um, and we did what we called an individual stress fingerprint. We tried to see what were the individual predictors um, from stress ratings taken randomly across the day, as well as sleep, as well as temperature outside, a number of variables. And we told, we randomized um, 30 of those patients to receive information about what their um, facilitators and barriers of daily 30-minute bouts of exercise was, or to not receive that and just to continue in the observational arm. This stress R01 was um, uh, inspired by the idea that if you're a capable adult of engaging in 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise and you're not doing it, probably the hypotheses you have about what is causing you to exercise or not exercise are incorrect. And concretely what I mean by that, I am such a person. So some weeks I manage to go for my three three-mile runs and other weeks I don't. And if you ask me why it is that I don't, I would tell you that maybe stress at work is what causes me to not uh, work out or fights with my daughter. So those were the hypotheses I had going into this. I also would have told you that I know I sleep better on days that I, on the nights that I have run during the day, I sleep better. Um, and so I always have been telling people running for me is a twofer. I both am you know, uh, causing better sleep, which is a, a good prevention for later cardiovascular disease, and I'm running, which is a good prevention for later cardiovascular disease. Well, it turns out I'm wrong on all three counts. So my stress at work had zero time lag predictive correlation to whether I exercised or not. And fights with my daughter had zero correlation with whether I exercised or not. And the amount that I slept and the quality of my sleep on nights that I did exercise was, was zero with, with the um, amount that I had exercised during the day. It turned out for me, the single best predictor of whether I exercised or not was whether I'd had seven hours of sleep, not the night before, but two nights before. So if I want to run on Thursday, I have to sleep more than seven hours on Tuesday night. And that is the type of putative cause that human beings are not 
likely to find. We look for proximal, um, salient, and hypothesis congruent causes. Um, so much of our prevention and much of the behavior that we're interested in having people change, I believe we have the wrong hypotheses about. And we have to start collecting data in order to inform people about what, in fact, is driving their behavior and then see if they use that in order to improve their behavior. Or in other um, designs we could do, if we then could change those um, uh, th uh, things that we found, whether they're etiologies or predictors, uh, without educating the person, just make it a, a different kind of uh, lifestyle for them that gets those kinds of triggers or problems or barriers out of their life. That was a long-winded answer. I'm sorry about that. No, it was good. <laughs> um, I just want to remind viewers that you can email questions to prevention at mail.nih.gov or submit questions via Twitter at NIHprevents using the hashtag NIHMTG. We have a, a few more questions. Um, in your expertise, uh, what other areas of research uh, besides maybe behavior in the behavioral interventions can N of 1 trials be used for? I really think for most of the complex chronic uh, relapsing re recurring diseases that we have trouble treating, that we don't already have a known cure for, um, obesity, exercise, pain, migraines, AFib, um, estradiol levels, glucose levels, all of those, we've not had a terrific, universal, clear treatment, successful treatment. And so for, for most of those, I think we could start thinking about collecting first the observational data to get that normative prevalence. And then when subgrouping doesn't work, if it doesn't work, starting to move into the end of one trial space. I can tell you that this or symptoms have to be chronic, relapsing, remitting. They have to be measurable on a relatively frequent basis. Um, and they have to uh, have some variation to them. If they don't have those, they're not amenable to an end of one trial. I do have the full citation for our article in which we have written up um, some of this information that I was sharing with you. Uh, it, it's Davidson, Peacock, Cronish, Edmondson. It was published in 2014 um, in Social Personality Psychological Compass, and it's called Personalizing Behavioral Interventions Through Single Patient N of One Trial. Um, it's August uh, issue 8, and it's page 408 to 421. Thank you so much for the reference. Uh, this last, or last two questions, uh, one of the last questions, in your experience, have you had any uh, experience integrating data from multiple N of 1 trials? And have you run into any barriers uh, aggregating data from multiple N of 1s? So from that um, stress R01 that was funded by the Science of Behavior Change group, um, we aggregated the 30 patients who were um, randomized to receive their stress fingerprint. Um, and what was great about the aggregation of it is we could, all, we could look just simply at the 30 of them and regardless of what they were told, did that actually change the frequency of their uh, exercise, 30-minute um, bout of exercise. And second, we could further subgroup them into the people who say there were some people for whom work stress or homework was causing problems, and so we could look at those 17 people. There were, interestingly, a number of people for whom sleep also impacted on their exercise, and so we could look at that subgroup separately. So uh, I have aggregated. It's just happened in the last month or so because the grant is finishing in December. Um, and we, we're being able to sort of start uh, just examining how rich the aggregation is for looking at both the whole group and for identifying subgroups within the whole group. Thank you. The last question is basically uh, centered around looking at the broader view of N of 1 trials and what you think the next steps are in the development of this methods approach. 
So I think the next step um, for for moving this field along is to find what I call the low-hanging fruit. And that's one of the reasons we've been talking a lot with patients and with primary care clinicians across the nation. Um, our, our, we're doing a Delphi poll to ask 1,500 patients what are the top conditions or symptoms for which they would like to try this kind of design. Um, and then we're asking a second panel of 500 patients taken from across the nation how long would they be willing to, to work on that symptom or problem? How many measurements would they be willing to take? Would they be willing to have it be um, controlled or not? I think we need to have one or two clear areas that everybody is interested in tackling with this, and we need to start getting some data in that area to have a use case that allows people from other areas of science or other areas of prevention or other um, uh, target organs, quite frankly, to start thinking about how they could apply this. Um, I will tell you that there was a recent Annals of Internal Medicine publication that had only 12 participants in it. Each and every one was concerned about muscle pain uh, as a result of their statin. And so they ran an N of 1 for each patient in which they reported whether they were having muscle pain intermittently through the day and they received a statin or a placebo, and they showed that I think it was nine out of the 12 patients had no muscle pain associated with exposure to statin, and eight of them then were willing to go back on their statin on a daily basis um, in order to prevent heart disease. So there are many use cases we have for this design. We just are just starting really right now to start um, figuring out the areas that this would be a useful design. Dr. Davidson, uh, and thank you for all the useful information and thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. On the Mind the Gap website, which is again prevention.nih.gov slash mind the gap, you will find several resources for this talk including the slides and references and a link to complete an evaluation. Your feedback is very important to us as we plan the remaining sessions for 2016. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, everyone.